You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with, with Sam Cedar. It is Monday, January 29th, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live. Steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Christian Picciolini, author of White American Youth, My Descent into America's Most Violent Hate Movement and How I Got Out. Also on the program, will tomorrow be the day Trump finally becomes president again today? Meanwhile, Chuck Schumer may have finally gotten it, or at least part of it. Koch brothers, meanwhile, gear up for the next SCOTUS fight and a massive expenditure in 2018. Fitbit. Apparently revealing a bit too much about U.S. military bases. The Trump administration supposedly considering a national 5G network because of China. And Trump says the ice caps are setting records. I don't know what that means. Bristol Bay may have just gotten a reprieve from Pebble Mine. And the Trump slump... U.S. tourism down, costing tens of thousands of people their jobs. All this and more on today's program. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is another week. Let me just give you a little bit of a preview of what this week is going to be like. And uh, we should say we are at full uh, staff compliment uh, today. Michael is back from his uh, Western sojourn. Jamie, of course, is here. Matt is here. Brendan is uh, is busy on the couch doing whatever he does over there. I'm not typing, pretending like he's playing the piano. Uh, also, uh, this week, we have the State of the Union address by uh, Donald Trump. Now, uh, most of you have a good sense uh, that the State of the Union is one of total exhaustion and uh, numbness, I think, at this point. But um, we will still hear from Donald Trump Uh, joining us. The plan is right now. Now, look, someone like Judy Gold, who is uh, in demand just about everywhere across the country for various uh, TV and uh, stage and, frankly, theatrical uh, performances. It's very hard to nail down. However, the plan is that she will be in studio, uh, not only helping us uh, narrate uh, narrate a g- rolling commentary on the State of the Union, but also will deliver a um, response to the State of the Union, and uh, that will happen. We're we're gonna we're gonna start uh, tomorrow. Uh, we were debating whether or not we should do a show and uh, this, and and it just didn't make sense to put out five hours of of audio tomorrow. Just doesn't. Um, it's too much. It's too much, ladies and gentlemen. So we will be live starting sometime between 8.30 and 8.45 tomorrow evening. And we will go for as long as it takes. And that is a threat. So uh, check it out. Also, uh, do remember that your uh, your membership is what makes this show possible. You can become a member today at Join the Majority Report. Somebody wanted to, uh, somebody asked me about um, uh, donating. You can do that at uh, Join the Majority Report too. As well, I should say. And also, I should tell you, it is now January 29th. We are officially 16 days away from Valentine's Day. What are you going to get? Your loved one or just someone that you, I don't know, tolerate uh, and uh, cohabitate with? should definitely include that in the card. I mean... I tolerate you. Yes, my dear. We've managed to do this, um, in a certain sense. In a certain sense, 
Now, you guys have heard me talk about uh, MVMT, movement, right? Those uh, two, yeah. two guys who dropped out of college, they started their own watch company. Look at you. You went to college. I know. I you're, regret you're not just dropping about, out every you're day. Just about, of course. You're just about to start your own company. It's actually true. Uh, but it is amazing how, how quickly this, um, this company has grown. They have sold almost 2 million watches in 160 countries. They continue to revolutionize fashion uh, in the belief that style shouldn't break the bank. They've even doubled their number of watch styles, and they're now selling high-quality sunglasses and women's bracelets. So uh, now's the time, folks. Valentine's Day is coming up. Our friends at Movement have put together the perfect interactive gift guide to make Valentine's Day shopping painless. Whether you're shopping for him or whether you're shopping for her, you find everything from watches to fashion-forward bracelets, sunglasses, at MVMT's limited edition gift box. They're all curated by MVMT's in-house stylists with their trendiest pieces that your someone special will love. Get 15% off today with free shipping and free returns by going to MVMT.com slash majority. Go to MVMT.com slash majority. Get 15% off. That also comes with free shipping, free returns. Join the movement. All right. So uh, let's, uh, well, I want to get on that in one second. I just want one quick thing from conversations we had over the past couple of days. Uh, I get an email, uh, somebody saying, taking me to task for not being as harsh on anarcho-communism as I have been on libertarians. And I don't want to, I don't want to litigate, I don't, I don't want to litigate this right now, but we should, we should get, we, we should obviously take more time and, and maybe do a show to uh, just uh, to dedicate to, to this. I have a quibble, but, sir. But, um, but let me just say something, the fundamental difference. Okay. Without, without saying any more, the fundamental difference in my mind, also, libertarianism, I'm sorry to butt in, it could be right-wing libertarianism or left-wing libertarianism, which is kind of what anarcho-communism is. Right. That's right. But um, those concepts, for me, I, I have the crossover there. I do have problems with those concepts, but I don't want to litigate that now. But the difference is this, and, and, and their charge was like, that's just as utopian as libertarianism, right-wing libertarianism, I guess, from this guy's perspective. And let me just say this. Even if I stipulate that that's true, that they're both utopian, the fact of the matter is, is that en route to that utopia, depending on which one it is, one is very detrimental for society, from my perspective, and one is benefits society. So that is the fundamental difference. We described this the other day as like, you know, we're all we're on a bus here. Some people stay on the bus longer than others. Uh, towards that, let's call it, for the sake of just this uh, point, utopian. But there's nothing worse than the libertarian utopia except for every stop along the way. <laughs> so uh, that's the, the fundamental difference. We will, we, we will have a, a, a more in-depth conversation about it. But at a future Well day. said. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, all right. So with that said... One of the things that is, you know, people have asked me also, why on your Twitter feed do you still have that picture of Donald, I mean, of uh, George Bush in his uh, mission accomplished uh, flight suit? Why, why do you maintain the George Bush obsession? And uh, part of that, it's just um, an expression of my age, perhaps. But, your obsessive but, personality? Uh, yeah, my obsessive personality. But the other thing is, is that, and Atrios uh, was uh, bemoaning this on Twitter the other day. I think I may have mentioned it, that people seem to have forgotten how bad George Bush was and how what we're seeing today is in no way uh, some, I don't know, uh, anachronism in terms of, of the Republican mind. This stuff has been going on for at least... A couple of decades, at least 
in terms of the insanity involved in the Republican Party. I wrote a book in 2006 with Stephen Sherrill saying that the Republican Party was not your grandpa's Republican Party, that the movement conservatives, that's what was mar marginal, has now moved to the center of the party and was taking it over. All of this stuff was quite clear then. And um, part of this came out the other day. There was a poll that said the majority of, I think, Americans, never mind uh, Democrats, have a positive image of George Bush. And somebody said, well, you got to look at the question because it's just, uh, you know, proof. No, I, I don't care. There's a huge failure, and certainly by the Obama administration and by Obama himself wanting to turn the page, failure in making it clear that George Bush and everything his, his administration representative was horrific. Hundreds of thousands of lies were needlessly destroyed and wiped out. Civilian lies. Uh, because of George Bush. And this is ongoing. This is ongoing. And uh, of all places to have been reminded of this, here's Will Ferrell on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> like I was saying, I don't know if uh, you've seen the news, but according to a new poll, my approval rating is at an all-time high. <laughs> That's right. Donnie Q. Trump came in and suddenly... I'm looking pretty sweet by comparison. <laughs> At this rate, I might even end up on Mount Rushmore, right next to Washington, Lincoln, and I want to say uh, Kensington. <laughs> I don't know. But the point is, I'm suddenly popular AF. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people are saying, man, I wish George W. Bush was still our president right about now. So I just wanted to address my fellow Americans tonight and remind you guys that I was really bad. <laughs> like, like, historically not good. So I get why you don't like this current guy. Heck, I, I voted for Jill Stein all the way. But, but please do not look back at my presidency and think, this is how we do it. <laughs> Don't forget, we're still in two different wars that I started. <laughs> hey, hey, what has two thumbs and created ISIS? This guy. There you go. That was, uh, that was, that was shocking. extremely well done. That was great. Yeah, that, yep. was, that was very big of him. All right, folks, uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Christian Pigellini, author of White American Youth, My Descent into America's Most Violent Hate Movement and How I Got Out. We'll be right back. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Christian Picciolini. He is the author of White American Youth, My Descent into America's Most Violent Hate Movement and How I Got Out. Uh, Christian, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Sam. All right. Let's start with um, your, your, I guess, your descent uh, into America's Most Violent White Movement, um, meeting Clark Martell, who, who was he and uh, how did you meet him? Well, you know, I, 
I think most people think that uh, folks that go down this extremist path come from a broken home or a bad family life. And in fact, that wasn't really my case. Uh, my parents uh, are Italian immigrants who came to the U.S. in the mid-60s, and they often struggled with prejudice. So it wasn't part of my family DNA. But I felt abandoned by them uh, because they worked so often. They were gone seven days a week, 14 hours a day. And at that age, I didn't really understand why. I thought... I had done something to push them away. So I went in search for acceptance elsewhere. And one day when I was 14 years old, after being marginalized for all those years and being bullied, uh, I was standing in an alley and I was smoking a joint and uh, a guy pulled up in a firebird, got out of the car with a shaved head and boots. And the year was 1987. So nobody really knew what a skinhead was in America. And he came up to me and he pulled the joint from my mouth and he looked me in the eyes and said, that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to keep you docile. Now, to be honest, at 14, I didn't know what a communist or a Jew or even what the word docile was, but it was as if this man had given me my first lifeline. Um, I was searching for an identity and a community and a purpose. And, and he was the first one to see my vulnerabilities and then promise me that paradise. And this is this is in in Illinois, right? At the, at that time, south southwest side of Chicago, nineteen eighty seven, uh, and in fact, Clark Martell was America's first neo Nazi skinhead leader, and America's neo Nazi skinhead movement had been born in that alley just a few years before. Wow. Okay. So this was like you just stumbled into sort of their lair, as opposed to the, their going out and actively sort of like recruiting kids because there's a quality of this that is like it's almost like um uh the like scientology where you know um back in my i don't know somewhat of my youth uh wandering around the streets of of boston i would get uh, approached by people you know scientologists and they're like you look like you're a little bit lost uh let's let's see what we can do here i mean is it, is it was there that how, how i guess how was that the dynamic a and b was that when when martel comes up on you are you the the fifth kid that he had done that to that day and this was like you know thursdays we go out and recruit type of situation yeah it's exactly how you're describing it sam it's it's about these very savvy recruiters who are looking for vulnerable young people people that they think that are broken uh or could use uh you know some acceptance uh, so it's no different if we're talking about Scientology or if we're talking about neo-Nazi skinheads or what we're calling the white nationalist movement now, or even ISIS, um, you know, people are looking for, and it's something everybody looks for identity, community, and purpose. And if we have what I call potholes, those things in life that appear in our path that we just can't navigate around like trauma or abuse, or for me, uh, it was abandonment or even mental illness or joblessness. If we have these things, these potholes that we keep falling in and don't have the right resources to pull ourselves out, sometimes we get detoured down a pretty dark path and somebody there will accept us. And somebody like Clark Martell or even me uh, later on when I learned how to recruit would actively always be looking for vulnerable uh, people who uh, looked like they were broken or didn't have a whole lot that we could come in and promise that their problems weren't their fault they were somebody else's fault. It was always about the other. And that's when we would use fear rhetoric and blaming uh, of other people uh, to, to remove the blame from them. And in fact, most people that I met in the movement uh, were self haters. They hated themselves so much for their own situations that they were very willing to project that pain and that hatred onto other people. So they didn't have to deal with it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I never met a white supremacist with, uh, with good self-esteem. That's fascinating. And and so when you went on and, and I don't want uh, we're skipping ahead here, but we'll, we'll, we'll go back and, and sort of just do the, the, the tick tock, I guess. But when you went out and ultimately became that recruiter, what were I mean, what were there outward signs that you would look for? Would you have to like saddle up the next to someone to get a sense? I mean, what, how did you know? I mean, I presume you cast a wide net. Right. But at one point you start to realize like, oh, I can I can raise my yield by looking for this sign or that sign. What what were those signs? Well, we would go to places where we knew that vulnerable young people would gather. We would hang out outside of punk rock shows and hand out flyers and, and look for the, the kids who didn't look like they had anything. Uh, we would go to skate parks. Uh, we would go to, 
to you know places where young people who were searching you know for uh, inclusion for an idea of of how they could change the world because young people are idealistic but they also you know are sometimes uh, misguided and we took advantage of that fact and it's the same way that now with the internet that uh, this new uh, metastasis of the movement is targeting people in forums uh, like gaming forums where they know that marginalized young people are uh, ADHD forums and mental health forums schizophrenia and autism uh, online uh, gathering places where they know that young people who maybe have been bullied who uh, might be more susceptible to a, a certain message that's very black and white they're actively looking for these uh, you know, kind of broken individuals who they can promise acceptance, they can promise an identity to, uh, and, and a purpose can be focused because in real life, perhaps these people are socially awkward. They're not fitting in. They may be bullied, uh, and they're desperately looking for something. And the ideology and the dogma are not what drive people to this, uh, to extremism. It's, uh, in fact, I think a, a broken search for that, uh, that acceptance and that purpose and community. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, as you, you say this, I keep thinking about that, uh, the, the documentary, Mr. Death, the, uh, about Fred, mm. uh, Luchter, I guess, the, who was, who, who became the darling, I think, of the Holocaust denial, um, if I remember correctly, movement in Germany, because he, w- he had something to do with like gas chambers in this country or, 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 or gassing people. And he was just like a lonely guy who all of a sudden like had this whole crew of friends uh, that thought he was this the, great. And it was really all about, you know, nothing to do with ideology as much as it had to do with like, I, I have a community now. No, that's absolutely true. And I, you see that in inner city gangs. You can see that in any kind of social group, uh, even even positive ones where people just want to, you know, feel accepted uh, and they adopt the same look, the same language, uh, you know, the same actions and beliefs as anybody, you know, in that, in that group does as well. It's, it's really about belonging. We all, we all want to be part of something that's bigger than us. Uh, and we all want to establish our identity. And sometimes we do that just by assimilating. Uh, and some of us may not be strong enough to, uh, you know, to be that individual identity. So we tend to attach ourselves to groups and those groups become bubbles. And sometimes those bubbles have agendas. Sometimes they're positive and sometimes they're negative. Uh, but uh, sometimes they, even though they are positive, have real trouble communicating with other bubbles. Uh, and I think that that's kind of the shape that we're in today. Uh, I want to circle back to some of those things and, and particularly about how that applies to, uh, to gender differences, but let's, let's move forward in the timeline. Um, you're 14 at that time. And then you attend the first meeting of what ultimately would be the Hammerskin nation. What, what is the Hammerskin nation? And, and also uh, tell us about, about cash. So CASH uh, is an acronym for Chicago Area Skinheads, and that was Clark Martell's group uh, here in Chicago, and that was the first recognized neo-Nazi skinhead group in the U.S. Uh, it started in the mid-'80s. Uh, and by you know, the time I got in in 1987, uh, some small groups and pockets of, of neo-Nazi skinheads had started to appear uh, across the U.S. in places like Dallas and, and Milwaukee and Michigan and uh, in uh, other places. And the idea uh, sprung up that they wanted to bring all these kind of uh, disparate groups in, under one umbrella. Uh, so the idea of creating this hammerskin nation where each state could have its own hammerskin chapter, uh, but would roll up into a, a national organization kind of took hold. I was at that first meeting where that was being discussed when I was 14 years old, and, and that was the first meeting uh, that I'd ever been to. And here was a room full of uh, 35 skinheads, you know, much older than me, uh, who, you know, were very angry, who were very focused and militant, uh, you know, who gave fiery speeches and uh, really, you know, instilled this sense of fear that if we didn't do something to protect uh, what we thought was being taken away from us, our white identity, um, that, um, you know, we would lose if we didn't 
revolt. So, uh, you know, the idea took hold to create kind of this national organization, which ended up becoming uh, still to this day the most violent and deadly uh, skinhead organization in the world. Was there any, like, uh, did they have any rituals? I mean, did you go through any, like, sort of indoctrination rituals or something like that? Or, I don't know, like um, blood handshakes or stuff like that? No, it wasn't anything like that, but it was the the sheer sense of the propaganda being repeated over and over and over. That was uh, the indoctrination. Uh, Part of the ritual was the music. Uh, Music was... uh, a probably the biggest propaganda and recruiting tool that we had. Uh, And in fact, I was in uh, two of America's first white power bands um, and the first to to travel overseas to play a concert in Germany in 92. Uh, But, you know, music was propaganda. It was education. uh, It was a social networking tool because it brought people from all different parts of the country together for, you know, the very rare occasions that we had concerts because they were very difficult to have. Um, But, you know, you'd have these four or five or six massive festivals where hundreds of people would come in from all over the country and use it as a bonding experience. Um, But there was also a ton of infighting that was fueled by alcohol and insecurity at these concerts. Um, And, um, you know, as far as ritual, it was the way we dressed. Uh, You know, we all maintained a kind of a uniform identity so that we could be seen uh, and the music, uh, you know, was kind of the common thread that kept us uh, together the same way that, you know, websites like Stormfront or the Daily Stormer do today for uh, that movement. Um, and nowadays, you know, what's interesting is that the movement is metastasized. 30 years ago, we decided that the skinhead look uh, was too offensive to the white American racists we wanted to recruit that was turning them off. So we decided to tone it down, throw our hair out and trade in our boots for suits and go to college campuses where young people were forming ideas and looking for communities, even get jobs in law enforcement or go to the military for training and, uh, you know, ultimately run for office. Uh, And the scary part is it's become normalized and we cannot see what we used to very easily see uh, the look um, is polished. The words are more palatable. Uh, it's it's become part of our mainstream discussion. Uh, and that was a strategy to blend in because we knew we needed to be among the people we wanted to recruit. Talk to me about and We're skipping a little bit ahead here, but that's fine. Um, because at, at 16, uh, Clark Martell, when you were 16, Clark Martell ended up going to jail and you were left to be essentially the, the leader, I guess, of cash. Right. At that point. Um, and what, yeah, I mean, what, well, so. So, I mean, tell me about those strategies. Like when you started talking, like wh- at what point? So you're in that movement for eight years. Um, wh- at what point did you guys start to like talk about this idea that our look is becoming an impediment that, you know, that even though this is um, sort of our, you know, these are our colors. Uh, wh- at what point did you say this is becoming an impediment? You know, I think in the early 90s, uh, David Duke was probably one of the first people to take off the Klan robe and, and put on a suit and start to run for office. Uh, so I would say, you know, in, in 1990, 1991, it started to become, uh, you know, the fashion to mature into a more normal look. Uh, you saw a lot of people join militia groups uh, and, uh, you know, adopt kind of that more American militant um, movement. Some people uh, who were in the Klan started to to just drop that whole style of clothing and uh, adopt a more Christian fundamentalist uh, look and, and viewpoint. Uh, and, you know, it certainly has spread over the years. And, uh, you know, we're calling these groups now the alt-right and, and white nationalists, which, in fact, those are terms that I refuse to use because they're marketing terms that that movement made up to seem, you know, a little bit more respectable and less hateful. Um, but, you know, in fact, there's that common thread of white supremacy and, and even neo-Nazism throughout all of it. Um but yeah, it's uh, it's taken hold uh, over the last three decades, I would say. Yeah, and I, and I want to return to that in a moment. But uh, one thing too that interests me at that time because that 
You know, that era, I was uh, a little, I'm a little bit older than you. So I, uh, you know, I remember going to uh, shows and, you know, there were mosh pits and there was, there were skinheads, but they weren't necessarily, it started getting confusing at one point because there were also non-fascist skinheads. I mean, almost, I mean, just as, as ideologically non-fascist. What, what, what was that Mm -hmm. dynamic about? I mean, did you run into that stuff? Yeah, I mean, most people don't know this, but, you know, when we think about skinheads, we tend to think about racist skinheads when, in fact, uh, you know, skinheads didn't start out that way. Um, you know, there are many non-political skinheads and certainly a lot of anti-racist or anti-fascist skinheads. Uh, but somehow, you know, through the media, they kind of get lumped in, unfortunately. Um, we fought with anti-racist, anti-fascist skinheads, often white skinheads more often than we did with minorities. Um, And the dynamic was that, you know, kind of what we're talking about Antifa today, that was, uh, you know, the precursor to that, what we used to call anti-racist action or sharp skinheads, skinheads against racial prejudice, um, were, you know, really the predecessors to what we're calling the Antifa movement today. Uh, It's nothing new. It's something that's been around for a long time. They certainly aren't terrorists like some people are classifying them. Uh, I would see them uh, as a resistance uh, to racism and to fascism. Um, But yeah, we, you know, the, the dynamic was difficult because we often had people go from one side to the other. Uh, Sometimes we would, uh, you know, turn people away who would become anti-fascist. And sometimes they would turn people away who would end up coming to our camp. And in many cases, it was still about this broken search for acceptance that drove people to, to one side or the other. And and so was there something, I mean, and it's just a question of, I guess, how, how that person situated as to whether or not they feel like uh, they want to join your skinhead group versus the, uh, non-ideological or, uh, you know, or the anti-fascist skinhead group, right? I mean, is it just like, it just happenstance? Who gets there first or, or, or just, you know, I mean, stuff that... Sometimes it depends on... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you know, sometimes it depended uh, on their past experience and, you know, maybe how they were raised and who they gravitated to. But it certainly was kind of, uh, you know, this gang fight to, you know, recruit more people. Um, you know, this was already a subculture that was shared based on our looks uh, and sometimes even music. Uh, and, uh, you know, it really didn't take much to get one person from one side to the other uh, because everything else was so similar. But ultimately, it was really about... Uh, you know, not about ideology or about territory. It, w- it was about social groups uh, that were at odds with each other. And so um, at one point, uh, you guys get the sort of the notion or the idea starts to, to come into broadly into your community that we need to be like a clean for gene type of situation, I guess, and uh, and dress mm-hmm. up, be more respectable. Uh, and you said people went into, did people go into like the military, into the police departments, um, specifically to recruit? Did they go in there and say like, hey, I'm going to form a beachhead here? Or was it just this is also sort of consistent with, you know, where we want to head to? I mean, how did that how did that work? Well, sometimes it was for purposes of recruitment. Uh, sometimes it was for purposes of, of getting training. Uh, you know, certainly going to the military would allow you to get combat skills for a revolution that we were convinced was imminent. Um, sometimes it was about infiltrating just to be able to change things from the inside. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes it was, sometimes it was a reaction to wanting to get away from the movement. Uh, certain people would say, I want to go into the military or recruit, but really that was their only opportunity to escape us. Uh, and, um, you know, people went through pretty desperate measures, um, to leave, um, and uh, oftentimes they stayed in because they weren't uh, strong enough uh, to walk away from the only identity and community that they knew. Uh, because starting over, once you're, uh, you know, a white, an open white supremacist is difficult. Not only are you, uh, you know, now faced with these friends that have become your enemies uh, and oftentimes want to hurt you, but society has a hard time accepting that somebody may 
be able to change. Uh, when in fact, you know, we all start out as not racist and we just kind of get detoured down that path for part of our life and hopefully eventually find our humanity again. Uh, so I do believe people can change. Um, but sometimes society, um, just won't accept that. So it's difficult to leave. And sometimes people stay in, uh, even though they question their ideology and, and, and denounce it internally, they won't do it publicly because they can't leave that sense of identity and community. Um, all right. So at one point, and this I found fascinating, and then I want to talk about Johnny Holmes, but um, uh, you were approached by representatives of uh, Gaddafi. Is that right? Do I remember that correctly? Yeah. It, yeah. In the early 90s, uh, a fellow hammer skin from Canada uh, had approached me um, to try and recruit me to go on a trip uh, where um, folks from Libya, from uh, from Tripoli, wanted us to meet with uh, people from Gaddafi's regime because he was actively interested in funding um, groups that were anti-Jewish, anti-Israel in the United States. Uh, I declined. Um, I was still too patriotic uh, to to want to work with. Uh, you know, dictator from a foreign country, especially a non-white country at the time. Uh, so I declined, and, and ultimately it ended up being part of a, a Canadian intelligence thing where several people went to prison. Um, uh, people like um, Don Black, who who runs the Stormfront uh, Forum for for white supremacists, and uh, and there was even uh, assumption that David Duke was involved in part of that as well. And some people went to jail. Wow. Um, what are the chances that that's happening today? Or what are the chances that that's not happening today? Well, I've been predicting for almost uh, 20 years that what we'll see eventually is, uh, you know, these far right uh, white supremacist extremist groups actually working with Islamist extremist groups. And while that might seem really odd, to the average person because they certainly don't like each other. Uh, one thing that they have in common is, is their uh, common hatred for, for Jewish people uh, and the Jewish elite. So I think ultimately you will see more instances of uh, you know, far right and uh, Islamist terrorism uh, occurring, whether that's training each other, sharing information, uh, coordinating attacks. Um, I think it's something that we will see in, in the near future. All right. Let's uh, tell us the story of of Johnny Holmes, um, because this is also, I guess, uh, uh, tells largely the story, or in some respects, the story of you, of of you exiting this uh, this movement. Well, once I finally decided to leave uh, the movement in 1995. Um, I had lost everything around that time. Uh, I had closed my record store where I was selling white power music because I had begun to meet people at the store um, that w- that I'd kept outside of my circle, people who were African-American or Jewish or gay. And suddenly I, I began to connect with them and humanize them and, and force the demonization outside of my head uh, and realize I had more in common with them than I did with the people that I'd surrounded myself with. Did they know? Uh, but the, I closed the, the store. I'm sorry. Did those customers that that came in because you met this wide array of people, people that you had demonized, did they know that you were a white supremacist and they engage you, or was it just sort of like, hey, I come in here every Thursday no, to they, check out your albums, that type of thing? You know, they knew. They knew. It was a, you know, Chicago is a big city, but it's uh, you know it's a small community as well, and and I was obviously very. Uh, well known for my activities, uh, and uh, you know they absolutely knew, and they came in cautiously, um, empathetic, uh, and over time they felt more comfortable. And these were the people that I received compassion from when I least deserved it. They were the folks I least deserved it from because, uh, you know, they were my enemy, um, and they were the people that I had hurt. And they still came in uh, seeing something inside of me that I maybe didn't even see myself, and and they you know, forced their empathy on me and uh, they didn't have to do that. Uh, But anyway, when I pulled the white power music from the shelves, because I was so embarrassed to sell it in front of these new friends, the store had to close. So I lost my livelihood. Uh, My wife and my children, uh, you know, had left me because I hadn't left the movement quickly enough and they weren't a part of it. 
Um, I didn't have a great relationship with my parents and, um, you know, I'd walked away from the only community and identity that I'd really known. So I suffered a, a pretty deep depression for five years. And in 1999, uh, a friend came to me very concerned and she said, you know, I don't want you to die. Please, you know, let's change something. Uh, and she, um, she encouraged me to go apply for a job where she was working at IBM. And I thought she was nuts. I said, there's no way that a guy with, you know, Nazi tattoos on his body, who'd never gone to college, who was kicked out of six different high schools, one of them twice, uh, is ever going to get a job, you know, with a computer company. And by the way, I don't even own a computer. Um, but she, you know, encouraged me to go and I went and I ended up getting the job. Uh, and I was thrilled because, uh, it was the first thing in my life that really seemed to have some forward momentum and meaning. And uh, it was a job setting up the computers and the network at a school district. And I was thrilled until I found out that that school district that I'd be you know, working at for the next several months was the same high school that I'd been kicked out of twice. Um, and, you know, as you can imagine, I was terrified. I thought, uh, you know, here I am five years out of the movement. I'm trying to build a better life. I'm, I'm a better father. Um, you know, I treat people with respect and, and with tolerance. And I'm just going to lose this thing that has any meaning to me. I'm going to go back to that depression where I wanted to, you know, wake up and, and wish that I hadn't woken up. And of course, you know, it's karma or destiny or or fate would have it. And that first hour as I'm creeping around the dark hallways trying to not be seen uh, or recognized who walks by me, but uh, Mr. Johnny Holmes, the uh, the older black security guard who I'd gotten in a fist fight with that got me kicked out uh, the second time and, and dragged out in handcuffs. Uh, and he didn't recognize me, but I saw him. And uh, I had never talked about my past. I'd been trying to outrun it for five years. I didn't know what to do. and I didn't know what to say, but I knew I had to do something. So I followed him to the parking lot and tapped him on the shoulder. And when he recognized me, he took a step back because he was afraid. And all I could think to say to this man who I'd, you know, hurt physically and, and tormented um, was, I'm sorry. And he uh, stuck out his hand and I shook it and we talked and we embraced and uh, cried a little bit. And he made me promise one thing after forgiving me. Uh, he made me promise that I would tell my story and that story ultimately became uh, the book White American Youth. Um, but uh, yeah, he was, he changed my life because he let me know that what was killing me inside was uh, the fact that I had been trying to outrun my past. Um, and he also recognized, I think, that it wasn't the story of some, you know, broken kid from a terrible family who went into, you know, a, a domestic terrorist group. He recognized it was the story or the potential story of every young person who was on a search for identity, community, and purpose, and then hit a wall on that search. Um, so I hope, uh, you know, I hope the insight that I give on what drew me in, what life was like in it, and, and ultimately how compassion helped me out, uh, will be able to reach other young people who might be struggling despite, you know, their race, their religion, uh, where they come from in society. I think it's a, it's a story that can relate to every young person. I, I want to talk a little bit about just about gender, because you mentioned, um, you know, in the context of of the white supremacist uh, extremists you know, sort of cleaning up and becoming uh, trying to integrate into society, uh, repackaging themselves as uh, alt right. Um, there's and, and talk about going into the gaming community, and then you start getting into sort of like these these uh, I don't know overlays of like uh, of men's rights activists, and there seems to be a lot of mm -hmm. overlay, and there's a lot of like gender politics. I'm curious as to what your perspective is on that, and 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 like where where people are situated, right? Because there's guys out there who it seems to me who are like supposedly who are sending, you know, I, I mean, frankly, I just, uh, I don't, I'm not claiming that Jordan Peterson is a, um, is a uh, white supremacist, but I just saw some, I was just watching a little bit of YouTube where he was talking about like, you know, uh, men out there or young men out there are feeling disaffected and uh, need to feel good about themselves and whatnot. And it seems like the same crew of people who are, who are being, mm -hmm. 
uh, who are open to these messages that they're going to give them a self-esteem. And one comes in the form of, of white supremacy and another comes in the form of like uh, gender rehabilitation or, uh, you know, not, I don't think they would say supremacy, <laughs> but they would say reinvigorated or some, you know, like there's some quality to all of this. Sure. And where where do you where are those fault lines? Where, where who feeds into what here? And and where is gender in this? Well, these types of groups are always very good at keying in on what's happening in society to that they can spin to use as fear rhetoric. So when you know gay marriage was first coming uh, you know on as a national topic, they used that to instill fear. Uh, you know, in faith communities that were already, you know, homophobic, uh, saying that it would destroy the ability to, you know, for Christians to to thrive and have children. Uh, now they're keying in on the fact that, you know, white, ma- white men uh, are being called out uh, for horrible acts, and they're using it as the victim narrative. So they are now appealing to, you know, potentially decent white men and and, and through the fear rhetoric that their identity is being taken away by feminists, by, uh, you know, leftists, by transgender and LGBTQ communities. You know, these movements are always very misogynistic. Uh, It is, it is about white male dominance. uh, And it's been like that throughout history, really. Um, Where, you know, anybody who's not a white male, you know, is, is seen as a lesser person. Um, and now, because of all the news that's coming out through Me Too and, and um, you know, and women's rights movements, they're using that irrational fear that white men are in danger of losing their identity or losing their power. And, um, you know, sometimes people get attached to this propaganda and hear it in a way that relates to them somehow, uh, but they don't realize that, you know, this is all through fear rhetoric and conspiracy theory. Nobody's trying to take away, you know, whiteness from anybody or the fact that you're a male. Uh, you know, we're just talking about issues that are unjust uh, and bringing them to the fore. Uh, thankfully, sometimes for the first time, and, you know, we're having these discussions and they're using it to just ramp up the fear. Anytime there's a, a seed of fear, they are throwing fertilizer on it. Uh, so you'll see them shift into different topics all the time, whether it's, you know, anti-Muslim when an attack happens um, or, uh, you know, uh, pro-white male when, you know, we see women finally getting, um, you know, equal rights or at least a platform to talk about the idea of equal rights for women. Well, so all right, so give me I, I, I'm curious, like in the context of, you know, one of the messages you have is that, you know, obviously, uh, to reach out to these individuals, that um, there's there's a chance that um, all of them, if not uh, some of them, are redeemable and whatnot. From I mean, what what about like the 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 leaders and and who who they uh, who they are, um, and and you know, and the thought leaders, you know, because you know, on this program, right? Like I will call out. Uh, members of the alt right, and uh, you know, we'll replay videos that we've seen of them, whether it's Richard Spencer or uh, you know, and I don't know if he's alt right. I mean, he's, he seems a full on uh, white supremacist Nazi, but maybe even my saying full on is not is not appropriate in this context. But guys like Gavin McGinnis and uh, you know, the guys who wear the the the, the Perry t- tennis shirts, you know, so they can you know. Um, mm-hmm. Or even, you know, when you have sort of a more of an intellectual veneer where uh, you're talking about uh, uh, mainstreaming um, a, a perspective on Islam that it is, let's say, the mother load of bad ideas, you know, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. What, 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 should, what should we be doing generally? And what should someone like uh, me who has a, you know, not a huge platform, but a platform and is it, is it, should I be exposing these people or is, am I driving them, you know, into a corner in some way? What is it? Uh, what, what do you think? Because you've obviously been working for at least a decade now on getting people out of these uh, movements. What, what's the best thing for all of us to be doing? Well, you know, I can tell you that there are two things that 
neo-Nazis or white supremacists love, and that's silence and violence. If we're silent, if we refuse to acknowledge that they exist, if we sweep them under the rug and continue to think that we're living in a post-racial society and we're surprised when we hear about, you know, a rally, um, they grow because, you know, they are able to now focus on the the grievances of people and tailor their approach. Um, If we are violent towards them, they grow because they then use that as the victim narrative, uh, the same way that they do the white male narrative. Uh, you know, they are now the ones being attacked. They're the ones who are being hated by the haters. Uh, they're the ones whose freedom of speech and rights are being, you know, taken away or, or oppressed. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're very good at spinning information. They're very good then at discrediting the other side and calling them terrorists. And, and that's why we're hearing, you know, such bad things about Antifa. And, and the reality is that Antifa are not terrorists and they're not violent. While there may be some people in those groups that are violent, there are always, you know, extremes in every organization. Uh, so the best example of of what I saw was actually just a few weeks after the Charlottesville rally in Boston, when you had a couple of dozen white supremacists rally uh, and uh, around 20,000 people from Boston surrounded them as a counter protest. And they said, you know, we see you, we hold you accountable. Uh, We want you to know that we're here, uh, you know, against your message Uh, But we're not going to adopt the same tactics that you do. We're not going to be violent or punch you in the face. We're not, you know, we're not going to throw things at you. And if you want a way out, here's a pathway. We'll take you because we have to understand that these people joined these movements because they felt marginalized. Things in their life were not going well. And for some reason, they thought that adopting a violent, hateful ideology would make them feel better about themselves. Because if we make people feel worse than we feel, then we feel better. Uh, So I think pushing them away uh, is not the right tactic, I believe, in bringing them in closer. Uh, I've had conversations with Richard Spencer. I sat with him for two hours in Whitefish, Montana. I was there speaking after, uh, you know, the the terrible troll storm and attacks that they received uh, at the hands of the Daily Stormer and even Richard Spencer. The Jewish community there was attacked Uh, online. They were threatened. Their addresses and photos and phone numbers were published. Uh, Their pictures were photoshopped, uh, you know, at the gates of Auschwitz. Young people, kids of, uh, you know, Jewish families and and children of the rabbi were were threatened. Uh, And the town was terrified. And Richard Spencer lives in Whitefish, Montana with his mother and his daughter about 50% of the time. And the other 50% he lives in, in Virginia. And uh, I was there, the community invited me to speak, and I spoke there, and knowing it was uh, a place where he lived, uh, I sent him a Twitter message saying, hey, I dare you to come to my talk tonight, I'm speaking in your town, and uh, I'm speaking about you. And he replied back saying he would come. And uh, he did come, uh, and I, nobody saw him walk in uh, to the auditorium uh, because he went up to the balcony and it was dark, and at the end of my talk, Uh, somebody had asked in the audience as the last question, you know, obviously our town is known for Richard Spencer. What would you say to him if he were here? And I turned uh, and I took the microphone. I looked up to the balcony and I said, Richard, would you like to go out out for a cup of coffee? Because, you know, I wanted to listen. I wanted to hear why he went down that path. I don't, I'm not interested in hearing his ideology or his beliefs or debating with him, even though he tried. I would always divert by asking him a question, uh, a personal question. Uh, You know, what his relationship uh, was like with his father, who also spends 50% of his time away from his family living in Dallas. Uh, I asked him, you know, how hard it was to be a father uh, to his daughter, you know, being gone. And those questions caught him off guard. Uh, And he gave me what I thought were pretty honest answers that seemed vulnerable. Um, And he admitted that he had, uh, you know, a tough relationship with his father and had a hard time living up to his expectations. Um, He said it was hard to to be away from his daughter and not be there for her. So I heard all these these potholes that I talked about. Uh, And while, you know, I still think that that Richard Spencer is, you know, a a pompous, self-serving racist, uh, I also know that uh, at some point he was not a monster. Um, at some point 
he was a quote unquote normal person who couldn't deal with something in his life that, that he chose to go down that dark path to fulfill that need, which is why I believe that everybody can be redeemed. Um, and you know, I approach everybody the same way that I would have liked to have been approached as a teenager. Um, at 18, if somebody would have thrown a bottle at my head, I probably would have punched him back. Uh, and it would have made me even angrier, but I approach with compassion and I listen, uh, and I look for the things that I can, uh, help with and build resilience with um, because once a person feels better about themselves they often don't need to blame the other for what's wrong in their life they're now accountable so let me ask you this has it is it is it you know are, uh, without having access to uh to richard spencer and and you know clearly um you you had that that moment but um is there any value broadly speaking to uh, I don't know, playing the clips of him in that, uh, you know, I think they had some type of like a meeting at a, at a bar and they were doing karaoke um, and and mm-hmm. and mocking those. I mean, for for those people who are no. out there thinking uh, this may be, you know, these guys may be guys we want to join or, you know. No, I mean, I, those things, if anything, work in the opposite way. I mean, when I saw skinheads on Oprah Winfrey's show in, in the mid-80s or, you know, Geraldo getting his nose broken, uh, that made me want to, to get more involved with those groups. You know, there's a fine line uh, between giving them a platform um, and for talking about them. I think we need to talk about it. We need to recognize that these things exist, but I also think that we don't need to give them a platform uh, to express their views uh, where they can infect other people with these, you know, with these false messages and conspiracy theories and, and, and fear rhetoric. Uh, we need to, we can't sweep it under the rug. We need to hold it accountable. Uh, but we also need to understand that by, uh, you know, ostracizing them, uh, we're pushing them further away. And uh, I can tell you, I've worked with uh, over 100 people uh, that I've helped disengage. And I've worked with people who were born into clan families who spent their whole lives uh, in them. Uh, I've, I've talked to, to KKK Grand Dragons who I've helped, uh, people in prison who've, who've changed. You know, we we can't think uh, that they're all monsters. We have to think that they're just human beings who are broken, who are capable of doing monstrous things. And if we can find them uh, a way back onto that path, I believe we can all do that through compassion and with empathy. You know, we tend to to hear the voices on the extremes right now uh, and they're the loudest and they're also the fewest. Truth is, is we're all, we're all floating around somewhere in the middle. Uh, and if we start our conversations with things that we have in common, the fact that we're Americans or parents or we have children who we care about and want to see succeed and go to college and be healthy, uh, if we can start our conversations there with people that maybe we disagree with, eventually we'll go off track, but we will have established that connection, that human connection. If we start out on the extremes and start with debate and arguing and, and calling each other names, and now both sides are calling each other Nazis, we never get to the middle. We never establish that connection. Well, I, I mean, because one of the things, you know, one of the strategies, let's say, the U.S. has, has followed when, when it comes to ISIS is to uh, denigrate ISIS, uh, to call it Daesh. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to make it less, um, you know, l- seem less cool and and attractive. I mean, is that the wrong? If there's a if there's a similar dynamic, is that the wrong approach? You know, I don't know if if that is uh, you know more wrong of an approach than you know bombing villages, which is really what's causing extremism, which is really right. what's causing anger, because extremists are using that fear rhetoric again saying you know the west is just trying to destroy our identity they're trying to take away our traditions uh, and the extremists are going to this general public to recruit by by instilling these, this fear rhetoric so you know maybe if we stopped uh taking opportunity away from people right. and, and this isn't just abroad I'm, even in our own country uh we'll see less extremism if we brought more opportunity to the world and to our own communities then maybe we'll see less people joining gangs we'll see less people becoming divided based on race or class um you know if if our institutions and our systems weren't heavily favored uh towards whites 
and against minorities and people of color, then you know perhaps we would be talking about this less and have to you know, have less of a reason to you know to to use slurs and, and words. Uh, but you know I, I would agree. I don't want to use ISIS because that's a term that they came up with, just like white nationalism and the alt right. Uh, you know we should be calling terrorism what it is. I'm not denying that it exists in many, many forms, uh, but I can also tell you that the biggest terrorism problem that we have is already living within our borders. We already have a white extremist terrorism problem. Uh, you know, Timothy McVeigh with the Oklahoma City bombing was one of the only times we've actually called it out as terrorism, but we didn't connect the white supremacist angle to it. He was a member of Aryan Nations. He was attending rallies. He was found with a copy of the Turner Diaries, which is a, you know, a fictionalized novel that the white supremacist movement uh, is a Bible, you know, they use as a Bible for revolution. Um, you know, we didn't make that connection. So we really need to, to understand that we already have a massive problem in our own country. And unless we start bringing opportunity to all the places that need it, um, it's going to continue. All right, and lastly, I just wanted to um, uh, point out that your, the group that you have since uh, left to, to start another endeavor, Life After Hate, was um, had been earmarked a grant for, I think it was 400000 maybe it was $500,000 um, in the last year of the Obama administration. And at a time where, you know, I'm just looking at a ProPublica piece from, I think, today or yesterday, um, a uh, a California man... Uh, Samuel Woodward um, has been charged with murdering um, a 19-year-old University of Penn, Pennsylvania student, Blaze Bernstein. And apparently uh, Woodward is allegedly a member of the Adam Waffen Division, which is a, um, mm-hmm. uh, an armed fascist group. I'm, I imagine you're somewhat aware of it. Uh, but that your group was given a grant to help get people out of this um this life style i guess or associations and the trump administration rescinded it upon taking office yeah that's correct uh, under uh, president obama uh, life after hate was awarded a four hundred thousand dollar grant uh, to ramp up an already successful intervention model that we were going to take online uh, to focus on um you know uh, counter narrative and, and reaching people who were engaged in these groups. Um, and, uh, we were thrilled. Um, we were the only organization that was awarded a grant that was focused on, uh, you know, countering white supremacy and white extremism. Uh, and we were patiently waiting for the funds to hit our account, uh, when the transition happened. And about two weeks after uh, Trump took office, we were notified that uh, even though we had won the grant, it was being rescinded and uh, weren't given you know, any specific uh, reason as to why. Uh, but we were one of, I think, only two of the you know, 40 organizations that won that were rescinded. Uh, and we were, in fact, the only one focused on white extremism. Had we you know, gotten that grant, we were already uh, ready to hit the pavement. Uh, and perhaps this was before Charlottesville happened. Perhaps we could have, uh, you know, averted and reached people who'd been there. Maybe even James Alex Fields, who was driving that car, uh, who was influenced by propaganda online. Uh, perhaps we could have, uh, you know, reached some of the Adam Waffen individuals who I've had contact with, some who are influenced by them here in the Chicago area. That's a really interesting case, uh, which I think you know, really speaks a lot to my theory that identity and community and purpose are what drives radicalization instead of ideology, because the individual in that Adam Wasson group, one of them had switched from a neo-Nazi skinhead to kind of a a radical Islamist uh, and, uh, you know, ended up killing one of uh, one of the roommates. So, I mean, it's a really fascinating story of why young people uh, you know, may do some of these horrific things that we constantly are hearing about every day, whether it's a school shooting or a racist attack or, uh, you know, flying to Syria to join ISIS. Christian Picciolini, the book is White American Youth, My Descent into America's Most Violent Hate Movement and How I Got Out. We will put a link to it at uh, majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate it. All right, folks. We're going to take a quick break, 
head into the fun half of the program where we will take your phone calls at 646-257-3920. 646-257-3920. We will also take your IMs. You just can uh, some breaking news. McCabe is stepping down. Yes, uh, I was just about to say you can also uh, you can you, you can IM us through the app at majorityapp.com. Uh, it, breaking news from let's see from NPR and from CNN. Uh, Deputy Director Andrew McCabe has told the FBI staff he's stepping down effective today. It appears that he's going to take a leave of absence. Um. He was set to retire, I guess, uh, in May, is it? Uh, March. And uh, if he makes it to March, I guess, he gets his uh, full pension. And so he's taking a leave of absence until then. Uh, Donald Trump is already tweeting about it. Uh, Of course, we will talk about that in the... uh, The fun half. Uh, What do you think about that? Do you even care? (laughs) <laughs> uh i'm not sure I, I i really don't know what to make of it i mean uh he's been taking a lot of grief and the story uh that the right will have you believe is that um her wife was getting money directly from hillary clinton in a campaign run that that she had and uh the reality is as i understand it um, his wife ran for office and uh, had received uh, a donation from a group that was supportive also of Hillary Clinton that he did not even vote in the general election, that he voted only in the Republican primary, um, and that the timing of the donation uh, came, the, you know, I don't know what it's supposed to indicate but um but he's been under uh fire for an extended period of time uh, uh, of time um and you know what the trump administration is trying to do is to get all of those people that james comey had kept in the loop with concurrent with his meeting with trump because this is the key here when james comey comes out of the meeting with trump where Trump is like, I need your loyalty. Or, um, you know, uh, the general is a good guy. Just let him, don't worry about him. It's don't, fine. Yeah. It's good. Don't, um, you don't want to go after him. He's Son's good. He's pretty stupid, stupid, but also okay. Right. Um, Comey not only kept notes, but he went and kept two or three people at the upper echelons of the FBI informed because, as we have learned, it's come out in like the the Me Too accusations. Those accusations that are backed up by people who will testify that at the time these events supposedly happened, they were told by the person that there was a concurrent story. So it's not like I kept the this I didn't say anything to anybody and uh, a year later I said, "Oh, Donald Trump said this." No, the guy got out of the office and then within hours or within a day or two informed key people around him that this happened. And I am telling you this so that uh, there is some type of concurrent testimony that I'm giving to individuals who are and and so the Trump administration is trying to Make sure that all of these different people are either discredited, out of the picture, not, they would prefer not have a position at the FBI. Just what the FBI needs, another Hillary voter. Exactly. So that's what's going on here. Um, And I don't know if that's going to really make a difference. Uh, One thing I should tell you that, we did not discuss last week on the announcement that uh, or the reporting that Trump had wanted to fire Mueller. But Mueller can investigate that. Part of his purview is investigating anything that could be perceived as interference with his investigation. Firing him would do that. I'm going to scope that out too, bro. It, 
and so anybody associated and let's put it this way if the story is that Don McGon was going to was going to quit if Donald Trump fired Mueller guess what Don McGon is going to do now he's going to have to test i think i don't i mean i know there's a lawyer a client privilege but i don't know if in this instance McGon can avoid testifying uh, or answering questions from Mueller. I don't know. But know that it's within his purview to investigate that. So Who's uh, Don McGon? I've never heard of I've him. I've never heard of that guy. I mean, you say you mention him. I never started anything with Don McGon. I, <laughs> I went after him like I was in heat. All right. <laughs> we got to take it. Now, that would have actually sounded a lot better. Uh, uh, folks, tonight. Like I was in heat. Because tomorrow night we're doing live State of the Union coverage, uh, the regularly scheduled TMBS that happens on Tuesday night is actually going to be happening on Monday. That is tonight. That is magic. Who will Indeed. be joining you tonight? Uh, Big Waz, Wazni Lambre, and then, uh, he, Ricky Rawls, Trevor uh, from uh, Champagne Sharks. There you go. Uh, so that's TMBS, 7 p.m.? Yes, indeed. 7 p.m. on uh, either on you can listen via the app, uh, the at majorityapp.com, or you can check it out on YouTube at our uh, Majority Report YouTube page. Uh, and of course, you can always um, subscribe via iTunes, which is what you should do, anyways. Yes, that's true. And for this show, everybody should just do iTunes for everybody, it helps. It helps, uh, it, you know, people come to the shows that way. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Um, where are we? Uh, what's happening with your Patreon now, Jamie? You... Dropping a post later today. Check it out. Boom. I wish you had a, like a hammer sound effect for that. Ching. <laughs> boom. All right, 646-257-3920. Be right back.